in verse 1. The first, therefore, also, indeed, had ordinances of service, and the sanctuary, a worldly one. For a tabernacle was set up, the first in which were both the candlestick and the table and the exposition of the loaves, which is called holy. But after the second veil, a tabernacle which is called holy of holies, having a golden center, and the ark of the covenant covered round in every part with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, and the rod of Aaron that had sprouted, and the tables of the covenant, and above over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, concerning which it is not now the time to speak in detail. Now these things being thus ordered into the first tabernacle, the priests enter at all times, accomplishing the services, but into the second the high priest only once a year, not without blood, which he offers for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Spirit showing this, that the way of the Holy of Holies has not yet been made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle has its standing, the which is an image for the present time, according to which both gifts and sacrifices, unable to perfect as to conscience him that worship, are offered consisting only of meats and drinks and diverse washings, ordinances of flesh imposed until the time of setting things right. But Christ, being come high priest of the good things to come, by the better and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hand, that is not of this creation, nor by blood of goats and calves, calves, but by his own blood has entered in once for all into the Holy of Holies, having found an eternal redemption. So far the reading of the scriptures tonight. Maybe we will take up with the Lord's help, the Lord leave us here, the remainder of the chapter next time. Yes, we are still in Hebrews. Um, we have uh, a few transparencies uh, to um, show, especially in connection with the first verses we have read tonight. And after that I'll have an outline of the portion we have read and then we may go into the details following the verses in more detail. What we see here is just uh, a model of what happened in the Old Testament under the tabernacle system. It's good to realize, though, that what the epistle to the Hebrews refers to is mainly what happened here inside. Here we have a picture of the, whole, of the complete tabernacle system. And much of it uh, took place outside the tabernacle. But the teachings of Hebrews would bring us into the sanctuary. Uh, maybe uh, just to mention three main points. When we study the tabernacle we have the first thought a dwelling place for God. On the basis of redemption there is now a dwelling place for God with his people and his people can dwell with him. Exodus 15. Uh, we see also that of course God's dwelling place is uh, the heavens and the earth together and the tabernacle itself is also a reflection of that uh, principle. The Holy of Holies, which represents the heaven of heavens, and the heavenly in the holy place, and then the courtyard here would speak of the earth connected with heaven. And so the altar would speak of the work of the Lord Jesus at the cross between heaven and earth. But when we see that this is a dwelling place, we may also think of Christ himself. Christ 
who is God's dwelling place. God found a resting place in Christ. And that's wonderful to study. And um, the third dwelling place we find is the assembly. The church of the living God is God's dwelling place. So that shows that the teaching we find in the tabernacle may be applied in these different senses, in connection with creation, in connection with Christ, in connection with the church. But I underline that for our studies in Hebrews, we have to uh, understand that Hebrews speaks mostly of what was happening here. And even when it speaks about the blood, of course the blood of the sin offering in a special way was applied here on the throne. We hope to see another picture of that. The mercy seat, the ark together with the mercy seat but in the Holy of Holies. So we speak of this tonight a little bit. We have also uh, mentioned uh, the, the altar of incense or this golden scent. We discussed that in more detail. The golden candlestick or lampstand and the table of showbread is mentioned in the portion we have read. So we realize that all these things mentioned here in Hebrews 9 verse 1 to 5 are inside the sanctuary which speaks of heavenly things, of uh, heavenly uh, dwelling place of God and even of his throne. The ark is the very center and we hope to refer to that uh, later on. Now just a few details. We have an impression of what happened there inside. We see here the veil. We have read much about the veil. And by the way, the veil in the tabernacle is never, was never rent, and therefore speaks, according to Hebrews 10, of uh, something which exists today, and that is Christ in his flesh, in heaven now, in the glory. And it's still there. So we hope to see that tonight, and also, Lord willing, in Hebrews 10. The veil of the temple was rent, as we had in our hymn, and so that is an indication that God has set aside that whole system, but the thought expressed in the tabernacle are eternal thoughts, are very precious thoughts and types of heavenly things. So here we see then the candlestick and the table of showbread and also the altar of incense, or we will speak in more details about this, and this was then the entrance. Now we cannot speak at all the about all the details, neither did Paul, but I think these uh, essential uh, points should just be mentioned. And here again we see mm -hmm. one of the main functions there of the high priest. We have thought of uh, the Lord Jesus as the high priest and the minister of the sanctuary in uh, Hebrews 8. And so we see here, maybe it is the high priest or one of the priests, because also we have seen that the believers have now a function, a service in God's presence. Either here in the Holy or in the Holy of Holies, in the very presence of God. And this brings us then to the center uh, of everything, the Ark, as we have read. We have read about the Ark covered with gold inside outside and also the mercy seat with the cherubim overshadowing the cherubim, the cherubim of glory it said here it's important to understand that this whole system deals with glory it's a glorious system and the points mentioned in the ark which was in the ark we hope to see in more detail the pots golden pots with manna Aaron's rod and the testimony or it says here the covenant so these are the things which are before us in uh, the first verses and now I repeat what we had here in verse 5 concerning which it is not now the time to speak in detail although we will take up some details it's good to realize that the reason why the author of Hebrews brings this up is to go on and to go to speak about the service and the entrance into the sanctuary. 
So this is his main burden, really. Now I thought we might just go over this um, review of the passage which is now before us and then go into some of the details. We have seen last time that um, there is a change of law and we have spoken and read about the new covenant. The new covenant would introduce a new system of things. It's the formal reglementation of this. And so the new system of things itself we see in our chapter 9, uh, which is based also on a new sacrifice. We have read about that a little bit and we hope to see more about this in the remainder of chapter 9 and beginning of chapter 10. Uh, we have seen Christ as the priest, a new priest, and also a new priesthood, although we Christians are not mentioned as being priests, we are priestly sons. That's the teaching of this epistle. And, but uh, emphasis is put on Christ, and therefore we are not mentioned as being priests, although we are priests. Um, the same that we have seen with the writer, uh, no doubt the Apostle Paul, but he is not mentioned as Apostle because all the light is shed on the Apostle. But we are worshippers. There's a new company of worshippers. We hope to see that in chapter 10, although there is some reference to that in uh, some of uh, the verses, but especially in chapter 10, where we enter into the uh, sanctuary, into the presence of God, and also Hebrews 13, where we see these new worshippers coming into the sanctuary. And therefore, it is a new sanctuary. It's not an earthly or worldly sanctuary as we have here in verse 1 but a new sanctuary, heaven itself. Then, we see then from verse... Is it clear enough? Uh, or should I focus a little bit? Verses 1 to 5, we have this true heavenly sanctuary over again, a figurative earthly sanctuary are called even the sanctuary a worldly one. So we see here contrast. And that's the thing I really would uh, try to bring home to you. Uh, the teaching here is by way of contrast. Although at the same time there are parallels. And that makes it so complicated. Because sometimes we see a parallel, we follow that. Sometimes we see a contrast. And so we have always to distinguish between contrast or parallel. But the contrast itself is between the true and heavenly sanctuary and a figurative earthly sanctuary connected with what is natural, physical and material. Then uh, we see in the first verses uh, the organization, how it was organized, the sanctuary. And in the last verses, 6 to 10 or 12 we have read, we see the service there, in especially verses 6 to 10. But this is in contrast to a new system of things, the heavenly sanctuary, which is the reality, as you hope to see in other places also, and Christ sacrifice and entrance for and that gives then our access. We hope to see the link, Christ enters, that gives access for us also, not only once, but permanently. Okay, so we have reality in connection with this new system of things and image types a parable we hope to see the shadows in connection with the old system heavenly is the new system earthly the old system although the earthly system in itself speaks of heavenly things that makes it complicated uh, in verse 12 we have this free entrance because Christ entered. You have to see that in verse 12. So, he has entered. That makes uh, the entrance free for the believer. As priestly sons to enter and to be in God's presence. presence. Not through a rent veil, but through the veil. Like the high priest in the Old Testament. The veil was there. And so he could enter once a year. Despite the fact that the veil was there. But they could not enter besides once a year or the high priest could not enter and the priest could never enter because of God's commandment and so therefore we have here closed veil the old system is characterized by a closed 
veil because of God's command. So I mentioned here and it's important for us to understand there are contrasts, huge contrasts and that is really the burden of his message. But at the same time we see parallels. The old system, the tabernacle, uh, is a system of images of a heavenly system of things. Now, this old system was limited because of the law. It was given in connection with the law. But we see that the types themselves go beyond that, much beyond that. I mentioned two verses here, Exodus 25 verse 22, where we see that Moses could come to the presence of God and speak with God all the time. In Numbers 7 verse 89 we see the same thought that Moses could come to the presence of God, God would speak with him and he spoke with God. And uh, Numbers 18 verse 7 is for me a very remarkable verse that shows that the types as, as such go beyond the setting of those days. Numbers 18 verse 7 we have the service of the priest but thou and thy sons with thee shall attend to your priesthood for all that concerns the altar. Okay, there's no problem with that because it was outside the, the veil, that was outside the tabernacle. But then it says, and for that which is inside the veil. Now, did ever a priest go inside the veil besides the high priest? Never. It was forbidden. Leviticus 10, Leviticus 16. So here we see what God had in mind really for priests, to have a priesthood, priestly sons, to service in connection with the altar, but also in connection with the inside veil. Now the altar we may think of the table of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 10, but inside the veil we, we think especially of what we have here in Hebrews 10 and 13, where we enter into God's presence. And so we see here already an indication that in the types, God was looking beyond the types. And then secondly, we see that because of the weakness of man, man in the, uh, uh, after the flesh, God could not go beyond this formal regulation. The types go further than this. So the type, are, uh, the tabernacle is type or gives types. Uh, of the revelation and manifestation of God's glories in Christ. We could sum it up this way. God's glories have been revealed in, in Christ and we see in the tabernacle the types of them. So, I have mentioned the tabernacle itself a dwelling place of God with his people on the basis of redemption but it is also a manifestation, a revelation of God's glory in Christ and now of course also linked with the assembly. God's glory is also manifested in the assembly, especially in the future as you know in Revelation. And of course the third main thought in connection with the tabernacle is God provides a way of approach, of access. And that is the main point now in Hebrews 9 and 10 and 13 to grasp for us, that there is now a way to enter. But that is given in the types already of uh, the tabernacle system. To go back just briefly to uh, the first transparency, we see it, could indicate it. Shekinah glory over the thro throne. Nobody just come there, but God comes out, as it were. He reveals Himself. And here we see the base of everything, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, the burnt offering, the sin offering. Uh, sin offering was not brought there, of course, but the fat sometimes. And here we see the gate. So people would come in there and find a reconciliation on the basis of the sacrifice. But then God introduced the priesthood, Exodus 28, 29, and through the priest we can enter for the service inside and even in the very presence of God. So the tabernacle also presents a way of access, a way of approach. And that is now the main thought we have before us in these chapters. Okay, so uh, just in connection with verses uh, 9 and 10 we have read tonight, we see in connection with the past there is the image 
The image itself was insufficient. We have this in other chapters, but also here in uh, verse 9, unable, that speaks of the insufficiency of this system, uh, of the old system, of the past. Unable, insufficient, imperfect. But, I've noticed here, with a spiritual meaning for those, for us, who are now in the present time. The present time we have here. So, what is that, the present time? We hope to see that closer, that is the day we are living in. That's the present time, where we have the reality of God's thought, the fulfillment of these types. So, the reality in the connection with the new system. And then, also in verse 10, is mentioned the future, the good things to come, and also um, the time of setting things right, refers to the future, in a sense, also to our day, as we hope to see. So, the main thought then, in verses 11 and 12, is Christ's entrance into the sanctuary. And to sum it up here, also by way of contrast, we see in verse 11, it is by a better and more perfect tabernacle. Uh, he is characterized by this new and better and perfect system. That is, Christ is characterized by a new system, not by the old system, which was imperfect. The second thought here, he has gone into the sanctuary, not made with hands, not of his creation, over against the other uh, tabernacle, as we have seen, pitched by man. The third point is in verse 12, that on the basis of the shedding of his own blood, or by his own blood, we hope to see again characterized by the shedding of his own blood, over against the blood of animal sacrifices, once for all, we hope to see, over against every year, Leviticus 16, an eternal redemption over against temporal. So again these contrast, but this is just a little survey of the verses we have before us, so maybe we can look now into some of the details of these verses. <coughs> the first is not mentioned in tabernacle. You can think of the first tabernacle as a whole, as a complete system. You can think of the system of things. You can even think of the first covenant. Whatever it may be, it was characterized by ordinances of service. And the sanctuary. So the old system had a sanctuary. And notice here in verse 1, it's called a worldly one. Not in a negative sense. Like in Titus 2, we have worldly lust. That is negative. Here it is in connection with this world. In connection with the first creation, if you please. Um, by the way, this is one of the ten different indications we find in the Word of God of the tabernacle. Um, there are many uh, different uh, names of the tabernacle. Tabernacle of the testimony, for example. Here we have the tabernacle, or called here a sanctuary, a worldly one. It's one of the ten names of the tabernacle. Then in verse 2, for a tabernacle, so he goes into more details now. In connection with his first system, his first tabernacle system, there was a tabernacle which was set up. And by the way, we find this word tabernacle ten times in the Epistle to the Hebrews. It's interesting. In the Greek text, it's ten times this word in the Epistle to the Hebrews. I underline here, it's important to see that it was in connection with the wilderness. Paul is not referring, the author of the Hebrews is not referring to the temple, Herod's temple of those days, although in principle the same service was going on there, but he refers to the tabernacle as in the wilderness. His epistle is, a, as we call it, a wilderness epistle. And so he refers back to that, but not only because of this. The temple would refer to the future administration in the millennium. And Paul cannot use that. He has to go back to the tabernacle because that fits in exactly uh, in the teaching he wants to bring out. And by the way, we have seen in the beginning of Hebrews already, he doesn't bring out new revelations as an apostle. He is speaking as a teacher here. And uses the Old Testament 
for the Christians, the Hebrew Christians, to make them understand what these thoughts were, at the one hand, and what their dangers were, were that they would fall back now in an outward Judaistic uh, system of things. So, he refers you back to the tabernacle, and then we no, uh, go on, the first in which were both the candlesticks. So what does that mean? The first tabernacle here refers to the holy, as he says, which is called holy. So when you read the word tabernacle, we have always to figure out the concept. Sometimes it would refer to the whole system of things, as we have seen on the first transparency. Sometimes it refers to the special uh, cover which was put over the tabernacle, as we have in Exodus 26, these ten um, different, um, what's the word, let's check the right expression, curtains, ten curtains of twine business. These ten curtains together, united together, are also called tabernacles. And here we find that the first part of the holy place, called the holy, is also called tabernacle. And later on we hope to see um, that in verse 8, uh, the first tabernacle is called there, the first tabernacle in relation to the whole system. It sounds complicated, but we have to read very carefully to see what the, uh, the expression exactly means in this context. So here, a tabernacle refers to the first part called holy, but includes also the second we have in verse 3, but after the second veil, a tabernacle, which is called Holy of Holies. So we see that the first part of the tent is called tabernacle, the second part of the tent is also called tabernacle, which is called Holy of Holies. So he's just explaining here what was going on in the old system. By the way, the word, the expression Holy of Holies is a Hebraism is the way the, uh, the Hebrew would uh, express himself when he would speak, uh, use superlative, uh, speak in those terms of greatest. We would say holiest, or, but he, they say holy of holier. Um, then he goes on in verse 4 to describe what was in the holy place, and in verse 5, what was placed in the holy of holies, you see? And so, we might take some time now about these um, utensils placed there, because it's very interesting by way of parallel. We have seen the contrasts are very important, but also the parallels. And so, we have here in verse 4, having a golden census. The Ark of the Covenant, okay, that's again the Holy of Holies, but then in verse, excuse me, I made a mistake, uh, in verse 2 we find the candlestick and the table of uh, the showbread. So that is verse 2, and then verse 4 and 5 go into more detail of what uh, was placed in the Holy of Holies. Okay, so we have to go back first to verse 2 for a while. We have seen the last time in uh, Hebrews 8, verse 2, that the Lord Jesus is called the minister of the holy places and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord has pitched and not man. And so we have thought of what he is doing there. You see how helpful these illustrations are. Because we have the tabernacle in Exodus 25 and 26 and other chapters, Leviticus 24, we know what is meant here, that these things had a deep spiritual meaning. And we see therefore that what the, uh, the high priest did in the Old Testament is a type of what the Lord Jesus does now, in a perfect way of course, in the heavenly sanctuary, as a minister of the holy places and of the true tabernacle. And he was there involved in... <coughs> in different uh, services first of all we find here the candlestick and secondly the table of the showbread but we know there was also the service of the 
over incense. And on the transparency, we have seen that that was in the first uh, tabernacle, so uh, what is called holy. But here, in verse 4, the suggestion is given that that belonged to the uh, holy of holies. We come back to that. But now first, in connection with the candlestick, where we see the Lord Jesus, his service. When we read Exodus 25 by the candlestick and also Leviticus 24, we see that there was a service going on continuously. And this would speak of what the Lord Jesus does through the Holy Spirit to uh, have light in the sanctuary, light in the holy place. And it's wonderful for us now that we may be in the sanctuary and may see the things in God's light, in the light of the Holy Spirit. And it goes even further than that. The Lord is the one who gives light through the, the meaning of the candlestick. And how the candlestick also would throw light on the table of showbread. Or as it's called here, the table and the exposition of the loaves. You see, the table, we see a type of the Lord Jesus as the one who sustains the people of God. As presented to God. We have to realize that we are in the sanctuary there. And that God wants to see his people as sustained by the table. Uh, I just mentioned these points, we cannot work them out in more detail now, but the table would speak about the Lord Jesus as the sustainer of the people of God. Of course, in the Old Testament, Israel, and now, uh, according to this real meaning, the church. And in the, in the millennium, again, we see Israel, these twelve uh, loaves. But now we see the people of God, the whole people of God presented before God what they mean really for God and sustained by Christ as the true table. And so we can link with this as we have seen in uh, Hebrews 8 verse 2, the service of the Lord Jesus, the minister of the sanctuary. He is occupied that the candlestick, the seven lamps would burn for the glory of God that you and and I also would burn as lights for God. And these lights would throw light on God's thought. That is one of the functions we may have. Of course, we are also testimony in the world. But that's not the thought here. The thought here is what happens in the sanctuary. And so we may be seen in connection with the light, and we may be seen also in connection with these loaves. The whole people of God, as God would see them in Christ, acceptable for him. Uh, the incense or frankincense was put on these loaves, according to Leviticus 24. So there you see how God would like to see his people in the preciousness of Christ. Speaking of the excell excellencies of Christ presented in the incense. But then we see in, the, in verse 4 what happened in the Holy of Holies. And that's difficult. It says here, having a golden censer. Now, some translate this in such a way, they say, have, uh, this golden censer refers to the altar of incense. And then the problem is, of course, but in the Old Testament, it was in the holy place and not in the holy of holies. How can this be? Now, there are a few arguments we might suggest that God, the real thought God had was that the golden uh, altar would be inside the veil. But because the limitations under the law, uh, where the priest would only enter once a year, God had placed it at the other side of the veil. And so we could re uh, interpret here the word having in such a, a way that although it was at the other side of the veil, it really belongs to God, according to God's thought, inside the veil. That is one of the interpretations. And also in uh, Exodus 30, we see that it's mentioned in connex connection with access or approach to God. So that underlines the thought that it has to do with God's presence. And in Exodus 40, when Moses is uh, given instructions by God to place everything, it's also very it's linked, intimately linked with the place of the ark. And this was also the case in Solomon's temple, where we... I just refer to that in 1 Kings 6, where we see a very remarkable expression. In verse 20 of 
First Kings 6, the oracle was in, and then in verse 22, the whole house he overlaid with gold, the whole house entirely, also the whole altar that was by the oracle he overlaid with gold. So again, a suggestion that this golden altar was intimately connected with the ark. But, of course, because of the limitations under the old covenant, it was outside the veil. But in, in a sense, God would see it linked with inside, and therefore we could read having a golden center as belonging to it. Now, there are other arguments also which would uh, suggest that this golden censer is not really the golden altar itself, but refers to this golden censer used on the great day of atonement. And personally, I'm inclined more to that thought. Because what we see here in Hebrews 9 and 10, it really refers to the great day of atonement. When we grasp that, we understand really what he is aiming at. It is a discussion of what happened at the great day of atonement. And only then, Leviticus 16 shows that the center was taken by the high priest and placed there uh, before the, the, um, the ark. So, it might really refer to this golden center used once a year by the high priest to bring it there and bring the, the incense there in the presence of God before he would apply the blood. You can see that in Leviticus 16, where the high priest entered three times on one day. First with this uh, incense, then with the blood of the bullock, and then with the blood of the goat. Um, he speaks here uh, about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark has many different names in the Old Testament. At least six different names besides all the uh, details like the Ark of Jehovah, the Ark of uh, God. Uh, here we have the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, and the Ark of God's Strength or His Might, and the Holy Ark. These are the main uh, uh, Expressions used in connection with the ark, but the ark is maybe one of the is maybe the most beautiful type of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. It is so um, complete in itself, a complete image uh, of the Lord Jesus. His humanity expressed in the acacia wood, his deity expressed in the pure gold with which it was covered. One person. We see that uh, in the Old Testament, people uh, once would uh, open the ark and then they were killed. We cannot really grasp the truth of expressed in the ark. It is beyond our capacity. God and man in one person. It's a, a mystery. The Lord says it in uh, Matthew 11. Nobody knows the Son but the Father. So, the ark speaks of Him. And we see then also what was in the ark, and that confirms again that the ark is a type of the Lord Jesus. We find the manna there, and the golden pot. You can read that in Exodus 16. The manna, over against for the people. The people were disobedient and not dependent upon God. The manna speaks of uh, the Lord Jesus as the one who was dependent upon God. J uh, John 6 would explain this in more detail. Uh, this golden pot was kept before the testimony. It was so precious for God that God wanted to keep it for all generations as a testimony. So this speaks of the perfections of the Lord Jesus in his life. But then we see the rod of Aaron. You see, Aaron's rod speaks of priesthood. Now we have been speaking about the priest. The Lord Jesus is the true priest. Here the, the rod of Aaron suggests that his priesthood is exercised in the power of resurrection. Number 17, you see that. The, the rod would produce uh, knobs, or would bud, and then there would be blossom and fruit. And, you see, that speaks of fruit produced in resurrection, as the word here also in, uh, suggests, that had sprouted. Power of resurrection. So, the Lord Jesus exercises his priesthood in the power of resurrection. And it's all indicated already here in the types. And then the tables of the covenant. There we can go even a step further. The Lord Jesus is now in the glory. And we had in the, in the new covenant last time, 
that Christ is written in our hearts, according to 2 Corinthians 3. So Christ, who is in the glory now, is written in our hearts on flesh, tables of flesh. So these tables we find here, the tables of the covenant, would express that thought that Christ is now being written in the hearts of God's people. In the future, um, the new law, new covenant will be written in their hearts, in Israel. But Christ is written in our hearts now. And the sort of covenant is there, a definite link between God and his people now on earth. And then we see over the ark, the uh, cherubim of glory. That's a very special expression. The cherubim would always maintain God's rights, God's glory, God's justice. They maintain this. Okay? So we cannot speak about all the details, but just point these points out, which are very precious for God in these types. And so the ark, together with the um, mercy seat, became God's dwelling place and God's throne. He dwelled there, and Moses could come there to speak. So that would speak of access. It's his throne in connection with his government. We find seven times in the Old Testament that he is uh, God or Jehovah who dwells between or uh, among or on the cherubim, cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat. They um, are satisfied with the mercy seat. The mercy seat covers the law, all the um, the holy claims of God have been met by the blood on the mercy seat, and so the faces of the cherubim look down on the mercy seat. They see the blood and they are satisfied. In the millennium, their faces will uh, turn outside because then the whole earth, the whole universe will be brought into harmony with God. So he says here concerning which it is not now the time to speak in detail because his intention is to uh, emphasize more the thought of access, approach. Now these things being thus ordered into the first tabernacle, the priests enter at all times. So here we see that in the first tabernacle, which is the holy place, the priests could enter at all times, accomplishing the services. So we have seen Christ as the minister of the sanctuary, and now the priests are types of what we may do as priestly sons at all times, accomplishing the services. But keep in mind, at the same time, the contrast. Verse 7, but into the second, the high priest only once a year. By God's grace, we, a company of priestly sons, may enter always, permanently, continuously. Not only once a year, and not only the high priest, but company of priestly sons. So they have the contrast. Not without blood, which he offers for himself. So here the emphasis is on blood, as we hope to see later on also, which he offers for himself. A contrast again with the high priest, with the Lord Jesus as the true priest. The Lord Jesus did not need to offer up anything for himself. And then the high priest had to offer up this also for the errors of the people. In Hebrews we don't see that God would uh, presuppose that his people would sin in rebellion. In Numbers 15 we have the expression uh, there is sin by presumption. That is an act of rebellion. And so God would never suppose that that happens with his people. But here we see errors, ignorance. And the sins of ignorance, of error, they had to be met by the blood, as we see here in verse 7. And so there again is a parallel with us. Then in verse 8, the Holy Spirit, and it's a precious expression, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit uses these things to show something. Now what does he show here? And again we have the contrast now, three points I'd like to underline, that the way of the Holy of Holies has not yet been made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle has its standing. Okay, this is very complicated verse. But just this point first. The Holy Spirit shows something that's important. It's not just a type, but the Holy Spirit speaks through these types. Like the Holy Spirit was speaking through the prophets in the olden days. So he speaks even through these rituals and through these types. 
Uh, another point uh, in connection with this old system we hope to see in verse 9, it's only an image. I've mentioned that in the outline already. It's not the reality of things, it's only an image, or a shadow as it's called in Hebrews 10. And in verse 9 again, it's unable to perfect as to conscience him that worships. Now these verses we have to look into more detail now. In verse 8 then, what does the Holy Spirit show? That the way of the Holy of Holies has not yet been made manifest. As long as, or while as yet, the first tabernacle has its stand. What does that word mean here, the first tabernacle? Here the word first tabernacle is not the first, as in verse 2, the holy place. Here it is the whole system. This whole system is called here the first tabernacle. As long as that exists in its service, the way of the uh, access to the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, is not open yet, not yet manifested. You see, uh, the entrance uh, into God's presence is closed, not only because of the veil, but because of God's commandment. And so, as long as this is the case, you cannot enter. As long as this old system exists, you cannot enter. That's the first point here. It excludes the thought of free entrance. So, the earthly tabernacle was with a closed veil and is now replaced by a heavenly tabernacle with a veil through which we can enter. That is the thought really to grasp. We have seen it already in chapter 6, where we had the Lord Jesus entering within the veil. In verse 19, and entering into that within the veil. We may enter there also, because Christ is there, as our forerunner. So that gives a suggestion that now there is the possibility to enter in within the veil. And in Hebrews 10 we hope to see through the veil. We enter through the veil. So there you have the contrast, the heavenly sanctuary over against the earthly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary with a closed veil, but now the heavenly tabernacle is an open veil. That is really an important thought. But as long as the old system is there, and we will be under the old system, we don't enjoy, we cannot enjoy, the new heavenly sanctuary with its free entrance. And so the rent veil of the temple indicates the principle of the change. That was indicated in the rent veil of the temple. And so both systems cannot go together. It is, it is as clear as the law and grace. You cannot mix. So this old or first tabernacle cannot be mixed with the heavenly new tabernacle. It's impossible. You cannot mix. Although the old was a type and in many ways helpful illustration, it's not the same. And so verse 9 underlines this again. It was an image or a parable, you see, of what God has given now in the new system. But a parable is helpful. A parable can instruct by way of contrast or by way of illustration. But there is always difference. It says now, an image for the present time. And that's also an expression to underline. The present time is the time of grace the time where we have free access, where we may enter into God's presence. And then, according to which both gifts and sacrifices, so that was uh, in connection with the first tabernacle, they were unable to perfect as to conscience him that worshipped. You see, there were worshippers, but their conscience could never be perfect. Their conscience could be purified. The great day of atonement, Leviticus 16, we see that they would uh, chastise their souls and uh, all their sins, the, the sins of the whole people, would have been confessed on the, on the goat. And so they would have a purified conscience, but never a perfect conscience. Because the next day, or an hour after the sacrifice, they could sin again. And they would need again a sacrifice for themselves, Leviticus 4 and 5, you can see that, but also uh, for the nation as such in Leviticus 16 once a year. So a perfect conscience was never 
uh, to be received under the old system. Never could you have a perfect conscience. And that is our privilege today because of the once and for all completed work of the Lord Jesus we may have a perfect conscience. So we hope to see that also later on uh, again the Holy Spirit will come back the scriptures will come back to this point of our position before God. A perfect position before God. And it's a wonderful privilege. And then it says uh, in verse 10 it gives a few details you know what was uh, given under the old uh, system uh, meats in verse 10 drinks and diverse washings these are all rituals in connection with the old system now you might say okay they have been set aside yes in a formal sense set aside but in themselves they are very helpful lessons they give spiritual lessons for you and me and again we cannot go into all the details of that but you may check up uh, in connection with the meats Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 14, where you have certain uh, prescriptions of what they were able to, meet, to eat. And drinks is even a wider thought. Drinks you have even with the sacrifices. And the first washing was uh, either for uh, the um, priests to make them, to uh, bring them into the whole system, Leviticus 8 and 9, you see it, and Numbers 8, or necessary to do the service or for the whole people in connection with methods of defilement and Numbers 19 so there are many different washings given but it says here ordinances or rules of flesh so that fits in again what we had in the beginning with that worldly sanctuary it has all to do with what is physical with what is natural here on earth imposed and that's a very uh, remarkable expression imposed until the time of setting things right so here we see that what was in the past is an image for what we have in the present time and it will be set aside when the time comes of the setting things right so as to Israel this refers to the future because only in the future the time of setting things right will come called sometimes regeneration or in this epistle also called the, the Sabbath rest or the age to come you see different indications the, the expression age to come is very familiar for the Jews but the time of setting things right publicly will come but for us in a sense this time has come now I hope you will follow this we have seen that the Lord Jesus is the great high priest uh, after the order of Melchizedek and we have seen in chapter 7 that what he will give in the millennium we may enjoy already now in a spiritual way and so it is with these things. In a spiritual sense, we are living in a time that things have been set right before God. And so we may enjoy these things, these blessings of the future millennium, we may enjoy already now. So we are very rich people, actually. When you see this, that what was happening in the past, these types, are very helpful for us. What is happening in the future may be enjoyed already now as we have seen the last time the blessings of the new covenant are belong already to us so we are a very blessed people and we are living now in the present time when there is free entrance so see how rich we are now verse 11 but Christ being come high priest of the good things to come precious expressions first of all high priest we see here uh, it's one of the ten times that the Lord Jesus is uh, mentioned as high priest in this epistle. So, I mentioned already as the true Melchizedek, but he is also a high priest now uh, to function according to Aaron. We have seen that in uh, chapter 8, the minister of the sanctuary, we have seen that a little bit tonight. So the Lord Jesus carries on this service after the image of Aaron, but not on earth, of course, in the heavenly, in the heavenly, in the presence of God, he does all these services and he is our Melchizedek and as such linked with the times of setting things right and you may enjoy already the bread and wine he will bring out in those days so he is is high priest but he is also high priest of good things to come and that of course would especially 
uh, be linked with the Melchizedek aspect. And the Lord Jesus will come out and bless the people with bread and wine, as Melchizedek did. The good things to come um, is a very special expression. When we would study in this epistle what good things to come there are, we I'll just mention them briefly, quickly, and then we will finish with the last verse. You might just make some notes of these good things to come, which we enjoy already now. Eternal salvation, we had in chapter 5, verse 9. Eternal redemption, we have here in verse 12, chapter 9, verse 12. We have an eternal inheritance in 9, verse 15. An eternal covenant in chapter 13, verse 20. The fifth blessing is a perfected conscience. We have been speaking about that. That is something we have now, and they will have in the millennium. The sixth point is free entrance, access into the heavenly places. This will be developed more in chapter 10, but we enjoy this already now. And fellowship with God. We have seen that last time in connection with the new covenant, and uh, we hope to see that in the next part of this chapter, 9 verse 14. So wonderful blessings, which belong already to us as the good things to come for Israel they belong in its full spiritual value already to us and then he says in verse 11 how this came about by the better and more perfect tabernacle so how would Christ bring in these good things to come how would he set things right and all these things we have seen before by the better and more perfect tabernacle. I would refer here back to a note we have here in the Darby translation. Uh, first of all, in, if you want to read this at home, I just mentioned this. In note D, he speaks of the tabernacle which represented the vast scene in which God's glory is displayed in Christ. It's a wonderful um, description, really, of the spiritual meaning of the tabernacle which represented the vast scene in which God's glory is displayed in Christ. And secondly now, in connection with this better and more perfect tabernacle, in verse 11, um, by means actually uh, characterized by these things. So he is characterized by a better or greater tabernacle. Notice here again, you can translate this by greater. We have mentioned already that in this epistle we see the emphasis on the greatness of the Lord Jesus. And so here again this word greater, but also better. That is one of the key expressions in Hebrews. Everything which is introduced now in connection with this new system of things, in, this, in connection with this better person, Christ, is better. And there are many things which are better in this epistle. But also more perfect. We've seen that there are beautiful things, beautiful types and illustrations, but now we have a more perfect tabernacle. So this new system, which is more perfect, not made with hand. You see again a contrast here, with the old made with hand. And then it says that is not of this creation. We see that also in chapter 10 in more detail. Um, I have here a note in... Mark 14, verse 58. I'll just read it for you. That is helpful. We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple which is made with hands, and in the course of three days I will build another not made with hands. So, uh, this refers also to the Lord's body, but we see it speaks of a new system of things introduced with the coming of the Lord and with the accomplishing of his work. Then in verse 12, our last verse for tonight, nor by blood of goats and calves. It was not characterized by this, these sacrifices, but characterized by his own blood. In the power of his own blood, but especially this. This whole new system is characterized and based on his own blood. He has entered in once for all. Now when we go back to Leviticus 16, we see that the high priest entered three times, and uh, this verse 
would, uh, uh, would help us not to see it in a too literal sense. There have been explanations which would suggest that, okay, Christ had to enter with his own blood in the presence of God, and then only God would accept it. Now, the moment that the Lord shed his blood, God has accepted it. But, of course, he enters in the value of this blood. He enters characterized by the fact that he has given his own blood. That is the thought. Not necessarily that he would enter literally with his own blood, like the high priest in the Old Testament. These are types which help to understand what Christ did. Now, his own blood, precious, his own blood. He has entered in once for all. And this again a theme which is developed later on, once for all, over against all these repetitions once a year or every day in the Old Testament, into the Holy of Holies. So here the Holy of Holies is not in connection with the first tabernacle, but is this heavenly tabernacle system. You see how complicated it is, how you have to read with very, very much care, here into the Holy of Holies refers to the heavenly sanctuary. Having found an eternal redemption. An eternal redemption is one of these good things to, to come, as we enjoy them already now, I said. It's great to see what the value of Christ's blood means. Here it is um, in connection with redemption. We have also salvation, eternal salvation, means freed, uh, freed or set free from harm or danger. But here the thought of bought free, uh, also made free from transgressions or from guilt or whatever is against us. Eternal redemption. So, may the Lord help each one of us when we uh, study these chapters. Um, it is 